Right, so welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see you here. And I'm very pleased and happy to welcome Elisa uh, Zensik from, uh, from the Nordisk Bank Investment Management Fund, uh, where she's head of policy engagement. Um, in particular, what she does is she um, engages with international organizations, standard setters, and policymakers on sustainability, uh, responsible investment, and corporate governance. Uh, prior to that, she worked at the UK Financial Authority, first on EU withdrawal policy and strategy, and then more recently leading the FCA's engagement at the Financial Stability Board. Um, earlier in her career, she was part of the European Commission's uh, secretariat team supporting the high-level expert group on sustainable finance. She's an alumna of St. Anna School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, Italy, and the College of Europe, Belgium, and holds a PhD in political science from the London School of Economics. Uh, Elisa, thank you very much for coming up to Cambridge, in particular um, in such uh, dire weather conditions. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Um, it's a really great topic, and I was very, you know, for a long time really looking forward um, to the talk. And so the floor is yours, and we're looking forward to um, what you will tell us about responsible investment. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Celia. So it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invitation. Um, so yeah, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about what we do um, at the fund in terms of the responsible investment work, which goes back a few decades. And I will focus in particular on big highlights in our recently published responsible investment report, which we do publish every year in February. So those were on climate change, responsible AI, so it's a slightly newer topic, and also transparency. And finally, I'll say a few words about the policy engagement work, which, which I lead. But let's start maybe with a few basics about the fund because um, you know, many of you might not know uh, what it is and how it's invested. So the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, formerly called Government Pension Fund Global, and more colloquially called the Oil Fund, at least in Norway, uh, was set up in the 90s um, to really invest on behalf of future generations of, uh, of Norwegians. The mandate of the fund is set by the Ministry of Finance, and it's the benchmark, it's very close to FUSI Global, which means we are a very, very diversified, large global investor investing across around 70 countries currently. Um, you can see the asset allocation here on the slide. So we have the vast majority uh, in equities, slightly above 70%, fixed income, almost 30%. And then we have unlisted real estate and unlisted renewable energy infrastructure, which is a pretty small allocation, although it's been growing a lot in recent years. Um, the allocation, again, is driven by the mandate. As I mentioned, we invest in 70 countries worldwide in around 9,000 companies, although that number is going down a little bit. Um, and on average, we own 1.5% of all these listed companies. So that's, we are a minority investor, but uh, we are an investor in, uh, in a very large number of companies. Obviously, that uh, ownership stake is a little bit larger in Europe because of historical reasons and a decision to overinvest. Basically, when the fund was set up by the ministry, there was also a desire to manage the foreign exchange risk because the inflows to the fund come from the oil and gas revenues of the country. Um, so the Norwegian ministry at the time wanted to kind of overinvest a little bit in Europe to better manage that, that risk component. And we still have a slightly higher allocation on a regional uh, and geographic basis in Europe compared to the rest of the world. We are a long-term investor, uh, by definition, we invest on behalf of future generations. Um, and we do believe that our returns depend on sustainable um, economic development, including in environmental and in social terms. Uh, and we have been a responsible investor for over two de decades. Um, you can see, I won't go into detail, but you can see the progress in this and the next slide. So we went from creating an ownership team of merely three people in the early 2000s. So at the very beginning, it's interesting to know we were not an active owner, so the fund wouldn't even vote of its, on its shares. And now this has changed so much over the last two, three decades. Um, we aim to vote at all meetings, all annual general meetings uh, of the company we invest in. And the ownership department, which is now called active ownership, um, now comprises more than 30 people. So it has been a big change. Um, we started publishing our first expectations. Um, those documents are targeted at the portfolio companies that we hold shares in, um, and they cover a whole range of environmental and social topics. They are primarily directed at boards, and they are the basis of our engagement with these companies, which 
um, I'll talk about uh, in a moment. And you can see the kind of the breadth and the scope of this work uh, really growing a lot over time. So that's both in terms of um, the topics we look at, for example, biodiversity from around five years ago. Um, but the most recent topic that we started, I guess, engaging on is consumer interests. So we published an expectation document on that last year as well. Um, human capital management as well. And another thing that grew and changed a lot is the number of publications, number of categories. So we have position papers on traditional governance issues, shareholder rights, but we also have investor views, which we started publishing last year. And that's a shorter and more topical uh, document on, um, on an issue which is of relevance to the responsible investing communities. So we, had, we have a few on carbon credits, on responsible use of AI, and on ESG ratings. So our responsible investment work and the way we present it, we talk about it and we publish um, about it is across these three levels. So the market level, which is really engaging with standard setters, with regulators, with academia, with industry initiatives. Um, and that's what I do, but it's also the portfolio level. So it's the risk assessment, ESG risk monitoring and investments, which I'll also talk about a little bit. Um, climate risk assessments and all of that, which covers the entire portfolio. And then we have the company level, which is really targeted at single individual companies. And that's both dialogue and engagements, which we hold, we hold over 3000 meetings every year, which still, as you can tell, is a minority of our portfolio companies, but it's obviously quite a lot. Uh, we aim to vote on all of our shares, um, and exclusion, exclusion. So we also might decide to divest from companies because of ESG risk or we are not allowed to invest in the first place. And those are the ethical and the product um, exclusions which are set by the ministry. Uh, and I'll touch on, on those as well in, in a moment. And there were a lot of, uh, lot of activity around that last year. So at the market level, for example, we, we published more almost 30 consultation responses to different, different regulators and standard setters. And um, we supported five different academic projects and we've been doing that for a number of years on topics such as um, CO pay, but also climate risk and its financial implications. Uh, and we made two new investments in renewable energy infrastructure, which is a said, it's a relatively small, quite small asset class, but it's been growing a lot in terms of asset allocation. And these are the expectation documents we have. As I mentioned, they are um, targeted at our portfolio companies. They cover the whole range of E and S topics uh, the most recent ones are those on consumer interests from uh, August last year, which you can see on the slide. But uh, we also recently revised our expectations on climate change. Um, so the, the number of topics we're looking at and we're engaging on, it's, it's been growing a lot. And this is E and G, E and S, sorry, on G, so governance topics. We have a different publication format, but we have position papers and we have our voting guideline, which is the basis of how we actually vote on such topics such as board composition, independence, CEO versus chair separation. Um, so we do that on, on the basis of those guidelines. So in 2023, as I mentioned at the beginning, there were three main topics for our work um, that we wanted to highlight. That's climate, uh, AI, and uh, transparency. So I'll spend a few, a few minutes um, talking about each of these in turn. So climate change, we published actually our dedicated climate action plan in 2022. So almost two years ago, uh, the ambition or the main kind of high level target of the action plan is for all of our portfolio companies to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, it's very clear from our analysis and because we are essentially universal um, asset owner that climate change is a very clear financial risk for us. So we stand to gain financially as well from an orderly transition um, and decarbonization. So we know that that's the only way to go. And we also know that while 2050 might seem very distant, the physical impacts of climate change are becoming increasingly apparent now and the transition needs to happen now. So while we do have these expectation documents and we work on a whole range of topic, it's fair to say that we have, um, we have a very specific focus and we have had a very specific focus on climate for, for a few years now. So the main kind of components of the climate action plan um, are the targets. So as I said, we're, we're hoping or we're working towards a net zero target for all companies so in our portfolio. 
And the way we're going about that, we decided not to divest. So we are broadly invested in um, in fossil fuels as well, differently from other investors. And obviously that's a legitimate choice. Uh, but we really want to engage to change. So we are in close dialogue with our portfolio holdings, especially the highest emitters, to try and support them through transition, but also challenge them when we think they're not um, going far or fast enough. Uh, and also transparency. So we aim to be really transparent and disclosing not just what we do, the activities, how many companies we we invest in, we engage with, what exactly we're doing, but also increasingly reporting on the outcomes and the progress of this dialogue, which is a relatively new area. And it's obviously uh, one with its own challenges. So target setting is one of the main indicators and KPIs, so to speak, of the Climate Action Plan. Um, and last year we have built Tracker, which actually allows to follow on a weekly basis the developments in, in companies' target setting towards net zero. And we actually see that this is moving pretty fast, as you can tell from the slide. So 790 more companies um, last year set credible science-based net zero targets. And that covers um, almost 70% of the financed emissions in our portfolio. So this is happening worldwide, and you don't really see it from the slide, but the biggest jump last year actually happened in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so it's clear that Asia is really accelerating its, um, its climate transition. And targets are important, they are a starting point, but so is the progress towards these targets. And we're increasingly shifting our focus from companies having a mere target and pushing companies to set a target, towards really assessing and engaging their progress and what they're actually doing, the actions and the levers to get to net zero. Um, so we updated, as I mentioned, our climate change expectations in September last year. Um, this document is really the backbone of our company engagement on this topic. Um, and our sharpened expectations, it's actually interesting to know that the climate change was one of the first expectation documents we had of our portfolio companies in the maybe around 2007, 2008, when we first started doing it. And our renewed expectations focus on six key areas, which are the board oversight, um, risk disclosures, reporting on emissions, uh, net zero, so having the targets, interim targets as well, so not just net zero, but also short and medium term, and the transitional plan, so the actual levers and actions and what you're doing to get there. Um, so this also reflects the focus in our company engagement. We're not just asking companies to set a target, but we really want to see what they're doing. We want to see the capital allocation towards decarbonization. We want to see the changes in product and services. We want to see whether they have an internal carbon pricing or not. So it's becoming a lot more um, granular as well, which means we also need to increasingly build up our knowledge base and our expertise to be, to be able to meaningfully engage with companies on what can be pretty technical subjects as well. Uh, but I have to say that the expectations have been really well well received and you know companies and other stakeholders seem to find them quite useful. Uh, we aim to be very transparent in doing what we expect and also principles-based because we recognize that they will not apply to exactly the same extent or in the same way to companies in different sectors or at different stages in their decarbonization journey. And we have a climate-focused list um, which currently includes around 250 companies. So that's obviously very tiny number out of 9,000 in the portfolio, but it actually covers almost 70% of our finance emissions. So um, it's clear that that's, that's where we want to focus our, our efforts. Uh, last year, we started a number of new dialogues. We have different categories of company engagements and dialogues internally, and these we call net zero engagements or net zero dialogues because they're focused on that. And you can see some of the new ones we started, like transportation, banks, technology companies. So um, you can see that we're not just, we're intensifying our efforts and we're not just focusing on engagement with, let's say the traditional high emitting sectors, which are on the left-hand side, what you know, we started doing earlier on, such as oil and gas. We obviously do that. And still the focus is on highest emitters, but we do it um, across a relatively large um, sector base. And as I said, we do want to support the companies. We want to support the boards in the journey. So we want to be like a friendly um, shareholder, but we also challenge them and we can intensify and escalate our efforts as a shareholder when we don't see enough progress. So something that we also started doing last year and will continue this year 
is filing shareholder proposals, which, as you might know, is a pretty commonly used tool in, in responsible investment and not just responsible investment. It can be done on any you know, more traditional, I'd say, governance topics. We're not an activist investor, but we are definitely an active one. And so last year we filed four shareholder proposals on climate at uh, four US companies. We ended up withdrawing two of them because of good dialogue and commitments made by the companies in meeting what we asked. Um, and the other one went to, to a vote and they, they received like decent support. So we're continuing to do that. Mm. This can be a pretty resource intensive tool compared to dialogue and voting, but we think it makes sense and um, it can be a good way to, to really signal to the company, but also to the wider market that we care about this. Um, we are also aiming to be, you know, the most transparent fund in the world. So we are disclosing ever more information. We have been doing uh, TCFD aligned climate risk disclosures for a number of years, and they traditionally you know, sit in the annex, our responsible investment report, but you can find them also on our website. So we use those kind of four pillars that you might know. So that's strategy, risk management, metrics and targets and governance. Um, and um, we are also a member of these relatively new task force, which was set up a few years ago. I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's the task force on nature related financial disclosures, which mimics very much what TCFD um, has been doing or was doing in the past. It follows the same four pillar structure in terms of the recommendations. Um, and it looks at biodiversity and nature more broadly. So uh, this year, for the first time in the responsible investment report, we started publishing and disclosing uh, our nature related risk. Um, so we've, we've done this kind of piloting exercise. So we're not doing the full TNFD aligned disclosures yet, but we're working towards that hopefully, hopefully next year. But it's clear from what we, uh, what we see and what we have disclosed that nature risk is very relevant for our portfolio, creating uh, you know, financially material risks and opportunities in sectors such as agri-food, consumer goods, um, forest goods, and, and others. So we want to act early and we want to contribute to better data, better methodologies, and we also want to, to encourage other stakeholders and other investors um, to do so. Um, these are just some, some stats. Again, climate change is a very relevant topic in our engagement, so we discuss it in over 800 meetings uh, last year, which companies that account for about a third of our equity portfolio, um, which actually means that we are addressing climate with investments that are worth twice the Norwegian state budget, so that is quite, quite significant. Um, and the discussions cover companies in more and more sectors, which acknowledge really how broadly, uh, how broad the economic scope of the transition um, is. So for example, we started talking to companies um, which are active or are, are providing climate transition tools, which are semiconductors, which maybe we wouldn't have engaged with uh, in the past or carbon accounting systems. Even, you know, commercial opportunities that didn't even exist a few years ago. Um, but our climate change dialogues continue to focus on the, on the highest emitters. Something that we also started uh, doing is really assessing much better internally, but also with the aim to disclose um, the progress of our company engagement. So when we engage with a company, we do that with an outcome in mind. Um, even though technically or formally we're not an impact investor, but we do that because we want to affect change at the companies we invest in. Um, and also we need more information to know what we want to prioritize in terms of speaking to the companies about. So in, in this year's report, we started publishing and providing more information um, on the progress of specific dialogues. So here you can see one example, which is, was a dialogue with mining companies um, on biodiversity. So we are, we've built up our capacity internally to track that, but it's still work in progress and we want to, to be even better at this in the future. Now I'll turn to artificial intelligence, which was definitely um, a focus area and like a relatively not a new topic, but defi definitely much more attention to it last year. Um, it's really amazing to see the speed by which it took off, not just in terms of development and adoption by, by corporates worldwide, but also the attention paid to it by, by investors and other stakeholders. So it is clear that the you know, how companies use AI, how they develop it, how they adopt it will have huge impacts for our, for our investments, for our returns. 
Um, just to, to give you an idea, just the value of our investments in the so-called Magnificent Seven, which are seven big uh, US tech companies, increased by more than 800 billion Norwegian krona last year, which is around 60 billion um, GDP, uh, GDP, sorry, um, mm -hmm. in British pounds. Um, and AI develops at a pace where it comes with a lot large but also unknown risks. There are regulatory risks, there are operational risks, there are business risks. Uh, there are impacts on human rights and society at large. There's a potential for large scale misinformation, deception and manipulation. But there are also a lot of opportunities um, which we see. And there's still obviously a lot that we don't, don't know. Uh, so for us, it was very important to move quite quickly on this topic and to develop a view and a position on responsible use of AI. Uh, so I think we were among the first investors to put out you know, a position and some thoughts on what, on, uh, on what we think about this topic. And we published this view, which is quite a short, like two or three page document in the, in the August of last year. And the view covers these three main buckets. So board accountability, um, oversight and governance, broadly speaking, transparency and explainability of models, and then risk management and processes. Um, as you can see here, though, AI is not a new topic in company engagement. So uh, we have been engaging with companies on this for a while, for a number of years, but you can also see how it took off last year with over 600 meetings on AI. Uh, we also shared our view with the boards of uh, 60 of our largest holdings are affected by this. And some examples of companies that we discussed AI with are the large US tech companies that I just alluded to. So that's Meta, that's Alphabet, um, Intel, and, um, and Apple. And we've also started focusing on specific topics within this kind of broad category of AI or specific sectors where we see particular um, risks or opportunities. So one is the use of healthcare, uh, AI in the healthcare sector. Um, so again, great opportunity for better, more accurate treatments, but also high opportunity, uh, high, sorry, high risk in terms of inaccuracy, access to healthcare, um, and serious impacts if the technology gets it wrong. AI in the tech sector, so we are particularly interested there in the governance and the risk management of the large tech companies who are actually developing and, uh, these models on top of everyone else who's adopting. Um, so they are all you know, shaping the AI infrastructure of the future. Uh, so we started these specific dialogues. And then children. Um, children's rights is also one of the first expectation documents we published, actually I think the very first in the 2000s. So it's a topic we've, uh, you know, we've cared about for a long time. Uh, it is a huge societal issue. Um, children and you know, young people in general are particularly vulnerable to to misinformation, uh, to abuse. They are often early adopters of new technologies. And so we are particularly interested in understanding how companies deal with these risks and managing these impacts on, on children and the younger generation. And these are all very difficult issues, which you know, means we don't have the, an easy solution. And it's a, it's a challenge for everyone. It's a challenge with companies, for companies, for investors, and for all other stakeholders on this. And then uh, more, more generally our engagement. So um, as I said, we want to be really transparent in what we care about and what we expect companies to do on a range of ESG topics in terms of governance, oversight, risk management. Uh, we are in regular companies with the companies we in contact with the companies we invest in. So that's beyond the engagement meetings we do. Um, and generally we, uh, we want to provide support. We want to communicate our views. And we care about topics that affect the long-term value of, of the fund. Uh, and here really shows how material ESG topics are. So we raised ESG in 64% of company meetings last year. Much of this is driven by the focus of our portfolio managers. So it's really integral to the investment thesis. Actually, our PMs are required to have a specific section on ESG factors when they're building their investment case. Um, so it's about strategy and it's, um, it's about, uh, business opportunities. Uh, but this says, uh, something about the prevailing materiality of ESG topics. Uh, you can see we had, for example, over 200 meetings on circular economy, efficient use of resources, avoiding waste, um, almost 600 on human capital. That's also a relatively new 
expectations and documents, uh, which we published in 2022. So it's how, um, how basically you deal with your workforce. Um, and then hundreds of meetings on the ever important topic of well-functioning boards and governance of the company, well-incentivized CEOs, so CEO pay is another focus area for us, um, and core governance topics such as capital management, which you can see is the most, um, the most relevant of them all, especially in a year of rising interest rates. So as an investor, we have the right to take part in important decisions through our voting. As a general rule, we side with company management, but we don't hesitate to vote against when we think there are reasons for doing, for doing so. Um, and voting is our most important tool as an owner, as a shareholder. So normally whole companies have an annual shareholder meeting or AGM. These tend to um, take part, at least in Europe, in between May and June. Uh, and at this meeting, everyone who wants to enter the company can get to voice their opinion and uh, vote on the agenda items put forward by management, but also the proposals put forward by other shareholders. Um, and our vote, our, uh, our goal is to vote at all general meetings. Um, so last year, for example, we gave, gave appro approximately 120k votes at over 10,000 general meetings. And here you can see just some examples of strategic dialogue, which we hold at board level. So we have this category of meetings, which we call strategic board dialogues with our 100 largest holdings, uh, where we meet at director level, at board level. And you can see some examples here in terms of topic we, we raise. So there's a lot of governance, but obviously for companies such as DHP, we also focus on climate change and the energy transition. And we also want to be very open, as I said, it's part of our intention to be very transparent about our, um, our voting choices. So a number of years ago, we started publishing our vote intention five days before every AGM. Um, and some researchers got interested in this um, and whether this had an impact on other investors and how they would, whether they would change their voting choice or not. Um, so they recently published a, a, an article and a preliminary finding. And the conclusion is actually that our pre-disclosure, where we vote against management, uh, leads to an average increase of three percentage points in such against the votes. So we can have an outsized influence on other, uh, other shareholders who also decide to vote against. They might do that because they look at our decisions. They might do that for a range of other reasons. Obviously, correlation is not causation, as we all know here. Um, but it's quite encouraging to see because we are um, aiming to, to also affect the market and it seems that other stakeholders, other, actually their shareholders specifically, look at us and uh, place some credibility in, in our voting decision. So that was really great, uh, great to see and obviously uh, it seems that pre-disclosing uh, makes our votes more, more powerful, uh, going beyond the 1.5 average share which, which we own. CEO pay, we're taking a more critical stand to this. I've seen that for the sort of 500 largest companies in the US, the median CEO pay has jumped to a record of 14 million, I believe, in 2022. Um, so we believe that's, that's too high, especially if it's not linked to value creation, and especially if the pay packages are not well aligned with shareholders' incentives, and they are extremely complicated and also short-term. So one example is that we voted against Alphabet CEO pay, last year. Some of the reasons are that um, this year receives a significant pay award every third year, which is above 200 million US dollars. Uh, and that could actually be significantly higher in if certain performance conditions are being met. Uh, the structure of this pay package is also not particularly long term. So it's less than five years, which we kind of use as a threshold, at the least. And also, it's interesting to know that approximately 25% um, of shareholders opposed to this um, pay item, the say on pay. Um, and it's in particularly relevant if you bear in mind that Alphabet has a so-called um, multiple share class structure. So it doesn't follow the principle of one share, one vote, but it means that some shareholders, typically you know, company management and founders, have a higher proportion of votes. So 25% of votes could actually be a lower number of, um, sorry, a higher number of, uh, of shareholders. Risk-based divestments. Um, so what I covered so far is examples of how we try to influence companies through our active ownership work, voting and meetings. Um, 
But there are some companies where we just believe that the risk is too high and we decide to basically walk away or not invest. So around um, two years ago, we started going through all of the companies that go into our benchmark index. The benchmark index is kind of the shopping list we use. Uh, so it's very close to FTSE Global, FTSE All Cap. Um, and FTSE adds and removes company from this index every quarter. Um, so obviously these, um, these changes are affected in, um, and affect the, the equity benchmark of the fund. Um, so we screen all of the companies that enter um, our benchmark to identify companies that have unwanted or excessive ESG risk before they enter the portfolio. And in 2023, this work uh, was really scaled up. So we screened over a thousand companies. Um, it covers all material ESG topics uh, and every market in the benchmark. We have only two weeks to actually do this, to make a decision between the benchmark changes and whether we want to, whether, when they come into effect. Um, a disenhanced screening uh, led us to actually avoid investing in 54 companies last year. Uh, so it is becoming an increasingly large part of our risk-based divestments uh, program. It's more than doubled since 2022. And then we also divest, so that's not linked to the benchmark changes, but every year we screen all the companies in the portfolio. Uh, and last year we divested from 86 of them, which might seem really small compared to 9,000, but it is significant. We mostly divested, uh, divested because of significant human rights risks and concerns, but the topics and cover violations of environmental race, um, uh, of labor rights, environmental rights, biodiversity. So you can see a little bit of breakdown uh, on the slide. And all these investments are financial decisions. Uh, we also analyze and track the effect of this ESG risk-based investments on our return. So we measure that every year. And since we started doing this ESG risk-based investment roughly a decade ago, uh, we actually have made a total of 10 billion Norwegian krona, which is around 750 million pounds from these divestments. So it shows that we actually can reduce risk and increase the return of the fund doing that. So ESG is very material. Uh, we also have ethical exclusions, so that's different. These are not financial decisions. Um, it's something that the Norwegian parliament decided on, basically the that the funds cannot be invested in companies that either produce certain type of weapons, that produce tobacco or cannabis, so again, product-based exclusions, or base their operations on coal above a certain revenue threshold. Um, so these are or violate fundamental ethical norms and human rights. So um, these are ethical exclusions and um, the Norwegian parliament also established a, an independent body, which is called the Council on Ethics. Um, and they are independent from us and they give advice to us on, um, on the exclusion of companies from, from the fund. Uh, but the decision is taken by our executive board. And then last but not least, <laughs> policy engagement, um, which is what, what I do, and we've actually just created a small team. So it's really working at the market level to, um, to influence all of the companies in that jurisdiction or even at the broader level, at the global level. We want to contribute to the development of global standards uh, that benefit the long-term interests of the fund. Uh, we've traditionally engaged a lot with international standard setters, such as the OECD or the UN. There are a number of very important tools and standards that they set, such as the multinational um, principles for responsible business conduct by the OECD or the UN guiding principle on business and human rights. But we engage with standard setters and regulators in specific jurisdictions as well, especially those that are largest for the fund, such as um, Europe, UK, US, Japan. But increasingly, we want to, more, to do more, uh, for example, in the Asia-Pacific region. So actually, we are hiring a person um, there. And the topics that we focus on, you can see on the slide, but that's corporate governance, shareholder rights, uh, disclosures, um, including on sustainability and climate and responsible business conduct. I think I'll stop there. Uh, so thanks so much for your attention and happy to take any questions.